joining us today. Um, there is, um, if you have any questions, you can enter them in the Q&A box. Uh, probably after last year, everyone's familiar with the Zoom um, technology. And then we're going to answer the questions in the last 15 minutes of our hour. Um, at the end, we're also going to survey um, at the end what is needed for your certificate to get a free CEU for most of you. Today, we're going to discuss a coordinated community response, and that is to linking and using our community's resources to help survivors. I am Judy Hafner, um, or formerly Judy Bertrand Hafner, for those of you that might have known me while I was at Pisco Legal Services. Um, and I am going to um, introduce our panelists. Thank you all for coming. Um, the first person I'd like to introduce is Ellen Rose, and she is an attorney with the Siemens Family Law Group. And Ellen has done a lot of work um, with Safe Light and also um, with um, domestic violence survivors and sexual assault survivors as well. So thank you, Ellen. We also have from Pisca Legal Services, um, Megan Moran, and Megan is an attorney with Pisca, and I'm not sure how long she's been there, but long enough to uh, realize how much work is need to be done, and she and Ellen both are aware of how much we've accomplished and how far we need to go as far as the court system. Um, and then also from the uh, Newman Law Firm, Marian Holliker, who's an attorney who practices in both Henderson County and Transylvania County. So welcome for you guys. If you would share sort of a little bit about your career path, Ellen, um, how you became uh, involved with survivors during your career path. Uh, thanks, Judy. Um, <clears throat> I have always dealt somewhat with domestic violence um, in the last 25 plus years. Um, I became more involved when I did some volunteer work with Pisca Legal, um, when I was actually studying for the bar exam here in North Carolina, um, as well as when I worked as a family court administrator in Wake County. Um, I was on the domestic violence um, task force there, which um, was, was a great group um, that from all walks of the community um, and then when our um, when the uh, chairman um, died suddenly, one of the judges, I took the the um, job as the interim uh, chair of the of the committee. So I've seen a lot of it um, from the legal end, and um, as well as um, services for victims when I was with Safe Life. Okay, awesome. And if I can ask you, Megan, to kind of share a little bit also about um, how you became an attorney or your journey since you've been licensed and um, particularly, I guess, what brought you to work at Pisca Legal Services, because I believe your role there is primarily to help survivors. So if you'll say a little bit about how you got there. So my interest in um, assisting survivors doing domestic violence work started in law school. I completed like 400 pro bono hours, primarily um, in legal services for uh, survivors of domestic violence. Um, and then after law school, after I passed the bar, I knew I wanted to continue doing that work. And Pisga Legal was a great place to get started in my career. Um, one of the things that I love about Pisca is that we are able to help low-income folks um, and specifically um, on our domestic violence team and family law team, uh, survivors of domestic violence. Um, and the sort of unique thing about Pisca is we are able to provide uh, really holistic services for our clients. So Whereas a client might come to us with, you know, wanting help with a domestic violence protective order, they may stick with us and um, we can help them with things like divorce, child custody. If they have housing issues, we can collaborate with our uh, colleagues on our housing team. We can help folks with immigration matters. And we also have a social work team that's really robust. 
um, that can help clients with a host of non-legal issues. So um, I'm really happy to be working here. I've been here for almost two years at this point. Um, so uh, happy to be here as well, talking to all of you about it. Awesome, thank you. Okay, and last but never least, Marianne Holliker. And Marianne, so I probably, I may be the only person that knows about your career path as an attorney and um, your work with survivors. So if you'll kind of let everyone else on your experience with that and how you came to be um, an attorney that worked with survivors. Sure, um, I started with legal aid in Hawaii in 2000 and I worked with helping victims get protective orders. And then um, in 2001, I moved in, into the prosecutor's office in Hawaii County and I was the family court prosecutor. So I handled all misdemeanor um, domestic violence cases for five years and then graduated to felony level and prosecuted all of the jury demands as well as um, violent crimes involving domestic violence, obviously. Um, uh, everything, murders, uh, protective order violations. And so I've done it for roughly 20 years. Uh, when I moved to North Carolina, um, I was a magistrate for five years didn't do a lot of work with domestic violence. Obviously I couldn't, but I did see the problems within the system. Uh, and then I was the attorney for DSS here in Transylvania County for a little shy of two years, saw some domestic violence in those cases. And now I'm in private practice and I have asked SAFE here in Transylvania County to um, send me clients that need help that um, don't qualify for PISCA services or PISCA can't help. Awesome. So. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you all for being here. So what we're going to start with is um, sort of our commitment and passion for the work we do um, is foundational to everyone's effectiveness and, and our ability to help any of the survivors of domestic violence. So in working with them with their courtroom, we're trying to focus this panel on how attorneys representing clients in domestic violence cases, how you have to come, um, how you have to incorporate all the resources that may or may not be available for the families, and also just what you have to do in order to get all the different services and remedies. I think that, Megan, you sort of spoke to that a little bit. And I know that when I worked at Fiscal Legal Services, sometimes when I would get a new client who was a survivor, it almost felt like sort of a, a house of cards. And in which problem do you help them with first? Because it's all kind of spiraling out of control. Um, and obviously you, you address certain issues in certain ways. I'd like to start with you, Megan, and just ask what services and program partners have you found to be helpful to serve survivors in your capacity uh, as an attorney for fiscal legal? Yeah, so we have a lot of really great partners here at PISCA. Um, I, you know, first and foremost would want to mention Safe Flight, which is vital to assisting our mutual clients um, with things like emergency shelter, counseling, um, job training, and a myriad of other things that sort of help survivors rebuild um, in ways that maybe we can't um, help as robustly some of those non-legal issues. Um, we also have important relationships with the Sheriff's Office, DSS, which refers cases to us as well. Um, and the Mediation Center is another great partner that we have. Um, they can help us um, with clients who uh, need help with safe custody exchanges, or if there's a situation where there needs to be supervised visitation, um, you know, we can put it in an order that, you know, that happens at the mediation center and, you know, they are sort of experts in supervising those sort of high risk, um, high risk visitations. And I'll also say we have really great partnerships with the private bar um, here in Henderson County. Um, we have 
our uh, Mabel program, which is our volunteer lawyer program. Um, and a lot of attorneys in our district are a part of that. Um, and they, uh, the attorneys that are part of that program can provide free consultations um, where we might not have the capacity to help or it's an issue that we don't have the necessary expertise to help with. Um, so, um, you know, having those relationships with the private bar is also super important and, you know, those relationships are really valuable. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm sure that, um, I'm sure that you could speak for the whole hour about all the partners and programs that you work with. Probably, um, probably you can too, Ellen, but Ellen, I would like to ask you to address the same thing. Um, I know that you have experience working in Henderson County and other counties as well from all sorts of perspectives, um, both as an attorney and then an advocate in the past. What kind of program and partnerships and services have you found to be helpful or what has been your experience um, with the programs that are set up to help survivors? I think the programs that are in effect to help our safe flight. I, I've never worked with safe before, um, but safe flight helpmate. Um, and I think it's very, very helpful when fiscal legal will take a custody case um, that is um, also a domestic violence case. Uh, what I see, and I'm sure you have too, Judy, is that our judges really don't like parties to use 50 Bs for custody cases. Um, so they really, you know, the, the victims need help with the custody work. Um, Absolutely. And the custody, yeah. And, and I think, I think, and this is, I think it's going on a little beyond what you're asking, but I think, I think education is so important um, to help advocates. Uh, I know that they, they can't act as attorneys, but to help them steer the, 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 the um, survivor in the, the right um, path to not encourage custody when it's not appropriate. Um, and I think that goes to educating our, our counselors, our advocates, um, our judges. That's a different story. We might get to that later. Um, but I think that the advocates in safe light um, in safe are critical to our survivors. Absolutely, I totally agree. Marianne, um, sort of the same question to you. Um, your perspective is also all different also because I know you probably had a different experience in the prosecutor's office, you were in a different state. And then um, from what you've seen through how the domestic violence affects the families through DSS, um, what, what is your thoughts about the programs and services set up to help survivors in any of those areas you wanna address? Cause I know you've had experience with several different ones. Um, honestly, the, the resources that we have in Transylvania County would be SAFE and um, the Transylvania County Family Resource Center, both of which are awesome. Um, I don't mean to be, I'm not trying to be negative or anything, but there are some, um, we're going to call that realistic today, Marianne. Okay. Um, I, coming from Hawaii, which, you know, being on an island in the middle of nowhere, I was very lucky to work for a chief who um, really believed in um, combating domestic violence. And he sent me all over the country to trainings. Um, we were very proactive. He got money for everyone, probation, police, our office to prosecute domestic violence cases. And it wasn't just throw these guys in jail. It was what can we do to fix the offender as well, which is really important. Um, and like I said, the programs that we have here, the obviously we have an offender treatment program. It's very good. Um, I know the counselors who are involved in it. It's important, but the other side to that is what resources do we have for the victims, right? Because for some reason, um, although not written on their forehead, it seems to be, um, abusers can pick a victim out of a crowd. 
I don't know how they do it, but they're really good at it. Absolutely. And I think the most important thing is for the victim to receive counseling um, so that she understands what the warning signs are, how to see it before she's in the middle of it. Because half the time you don't see it coming, right? You don't know what those warning signs are. So I think that's really important. And then the other thing is um, that I think Ellen kind of touched on, which is very, very important, is that the judges need to be um, educated and trained when it comes to domestic violence and really understanding it, as well as law enforcement. Because a lot of the times what I hear is, well, she's only getting a restraining order so she can do whatever. Not true. Okay. And the thing is for people to understand, I can't tell you how many times I heard women say, well, friends of mine who would say, well, I'd never let a man do that. You don't know. This isn't something that just happens, right? This is something that you could be married to somebody for 10 years and it happens. And where do you go? And what do you do? And if you're not in that situation, you don't understand it. And so I think the most important thing is to educate the community. And that was one of the things that my chief did. We were lucky. He sent the judges to trainings, which was awesome. We had a dedicated court that was family court only for domestic violence and domestic violence issues. So that's something that I would love to see implemented here, if possible. Sorry, not trying to be negative. No, no, no. I mean, one of the reasons that we're all here is because we're passionate about this um, struggle, which seems to be um, one step forward and two steps back sometimes. It sounds like what you're speaking to also is you're ahead of me. I don't know if you've got the the questions and you're just trying to get a jump, but um, you're talking about what the largest need you see for survivors in the legal system. Sounds like they need um, they need the people that they're interacting with to be educated. Is that what you say? Would say the largest need is? I, I think so. That's been my what I see. Yeah. I mean, and obviously not with safe, not with the DV shelters. They understand it. They get it backwards and forwards. But we need people outside, even just people within the community. Like um, I was teaching at Brevard College, and I did a what do they call it? A specials course where I did a domestic violence course for a semester with the students and with other teachers, and it was really important. Like people were getting light bulbs were coming on, right? It's really important to get the community to understand what this is all about and get them on board. I would totally agree because I think before I was educated about all of it, um, I, you know, you have within your resources what someone told you it was when you were growing up. And often those are not um, applicable to the people that we see in court. So um, I think that my mom told me that it happened to people that had low self-esteem and it happens to somebody who falls in love with an abuser. That's, that's actually how, what it is. Um, Ellen, what would you say would be the largest need you see for survivors in the legal system? I, I Education by far of the whole community. I mean, you have family members that say, you know, why is she letting that happen? Um, You've got judges who don't get it. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. When I was in Wake County as family court administrator, I had a question from the bar, one of one of the um, attorneys, that that kind of poo pooed 50 Bs and domestic violence, and said, "What about all those people who go for the restraining order um, that isn't really legitimate?" Um, and again, I had to answer that very carefully, but the, the answer in that case was um, our statistics were about 40% about of 50 Bs were not granted. And those very well may have been, unfortunately, it may have been some of the ones that didn't come back that needed it. But it also weeded out some that were probably domestic violence by statute, but not likely to happen again. Um, those that may have been trying to get the house or the custody um, so I think it, it naturally weeded some of them out, but the judges need to know. The judges need to know how to, how to tell, um, you know, what to look for, what signs are important. Um, and we're lucky in the state with our family court districts because those judges get specialized training or more training. You know, the districts that are not um, family courts, you know, like Transylvania and, and Henderson, 
don't get that extra training. Um, and I think that is so important. And like Marianne said, you know, that the, the, the law enforcement also, um, it's, it's, it's a continual learning experience. And I think that we, I mean, Safe Light um, is, is wonderful with getting out in the community and trying to educate um, our, I don't know in Henderson now how the sheriff's office is, but, but you know, they're, they're often the first responders. They need to be educated. Um, they can't think it's just a woman who's not getting out of a bad situation. Um, and like Marianne said, and I, I didn't um, touch on that, I think we need offender, good, strong offender treatment programs also. So right. to me, it's, you know, again, I'm a little cynical, but I think education is the most important thing to, throughout the community from judges on down. I mean, I would agree because education, if we can, the more people that understand it, the safer the whole community will be, but particularly those people that are in, in a domestic violence situation or people that are tangential. I mean, I don't know how many cases I've had where um, somebody else's child happened to be at the house and, um, and some of the horror stories about that we won't talk about on this, but the people that are just a friend of the family that get involved and get hurt. And Megan, unless you are super excited about answering that same question, I'm going to move on to another question for you. Um, so what, um, I, COVID obviously affected um, victims and survivors in a special way, um, as everything does. Um, it was a hard year for everybody, but how did you feel that it affected the population that you work with in the court system? What were the differences during 2020 for survivors? Yeah, so um, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, we saw generally an increase in domestic violence, but sort of alongside of that, there was um, more challenges for survivors to access resources in our community and to pursue legal action against their abusers. Um, you know, thankfully, there are, um, you know, ways that we've been able to adapt um, and sort of be able to be creative and provide services to folks in these sort of difficult times. Um, but, you know, that was definitely a challenge, especially at the pandemic uh, and at the outset of the pandemic, uh, specifically related to um, sort of legal services in the family law realm. Um, there were also some issues that we saw come up pretty regularly. So for example, um, with respect to child custody, um, we saw um, you know, abusers using the pandemic as a reason not to exchange the children, um, not because they were exposed to COVID or there was a um, need to quarantine, but just saying, well, it's COVID, so I'm not gonna exchange the child. Um, and there has also been an issue with um, abusers withholding uh, child tax credits and other sort of stimulus money um, that would go a long way in helping survivors sort of move forward, rebuild after domestic violence. Um, and there, especially at the beginning, there wasn't sort of clear cut solutions to that. So sometimes survivors had to sort of get creative and put that in sort of, um, you know, divorce settlements or other types of settlement agreements and civil uh, legal actions, um, or they had to try to go through the IRS, which is a painstaking and really lengthy process. Um, and then on a more general level, um, at a certain point during the pandemic, there were pauses on certain types of cases um, with those types of cases, you know, not being calendared or being pushed out. Um, so while protective orders was, were still being heard, child custody cases, divorce cases were being pushed out several months, criminal cases that needed to be set for trial were pushed out, um, you know, a couple of months. So it sort of delayed access to justice or needed legal remedies for a lot of folks. So I know that that was challenging for a lot of clients as well. Um, Ellen, um, the same, 
I don't know how much you dealt with emergency actions involving survivors um, last year, but did you notice anything that the courts supporting um, survivors where they failed? Um, obviously, no one was prepared for COVID, but how did you see that through the court services and the supports that are typically there that were not during the COVID pandemic last year? I didn't have a lot of emergency 50 Bs this year this past year, um, which I actually expected to have more. Um, I think the courts, as Megan pointed out, did the best they could with keeping, keeping those open. Um, I found a big difference in Buncombe versus Henderson County, but um, I don't know that it was a huge difference in regard to the emergency procedures. They, I, think, I think they were I think the courts did the best they could um, in that respect. Um, I think it was real difficult for some, for victims to get out. You know, if they're, if, if the abuser's working from the home and the, the survivor can't leave or, you know, doesn't have an excuse to get out, I think there were probably many, many um, restraining orders that were not able to be sought because of COVID. Um, but as far as the court and the emergency procedures, I think I think they did the best they could. Yeah, that was actually, unfortunately, one of my first thoughts when the lockdown happened was what what is what is going to happen? Because the, no one's gonna leave when there's nowhere to go. Um, and you can't go to work and you can't go to school. And that's just sort of a nightmare for those of us that have worked with this population for a long time. And, and Marianne, what would you what, what would you like to comment on that? Um, so I was uh, the attorney for DSS when COVID came, and um, you know we were really limited. We had no court dates in the beginning, um, which was horrible. Um, and then we had very limited time, and so. You know, with a backlog of cases, your goal is to get these cases moving and you're under basically like a one year deadline, right? To get these kids permanency. Um, and so one of the things that I did was make sure that I could get everything done with the opposing counsel outside of court so that when we came in, there was no reason to continue it. And what I'm about to say is not gonna be popular, but um, when it comes to attorneys, the more prepared that you can be and the more talking that you do outside of court so that when you come in, you're ready to go and not continue on your client, the better, especially if it's a DB case. And the other thing that I noticed, and I've talked to SAFE about this as far as um, people going in for a 50B, and I, and I understand that you know the volunteers who go with the, the victims, they're not attorneys for the most part. Um, but to be as specific and as ready as you can in that 50B and to really give the court everything that they need right then and there without having to ask for a continuance or with you know not understanding what exactly the court is looking for. It's so important. I think the less time we take continuing cases and the more we move to you know really further our client's case, the better we are. The more talking we can do outside of court the better off everybody is, my personal opinion. Um, well, we'll have to find out later um, who, who, who might be offended by that. I'm interested, I'm just interested. Um, okay, so I, I feel like the, the other couple questions that we have, these are kind of all the same question, unfortunately. And I think that that's just because it's a it's glaringly obvious probably to those of us that have worked with victims um there's so many unmet needs but the the largest needs all kind of circle around the same theme um but one of the things that y'all have kind of talked about is that edge lack of education but what are the what specifically are the gaps and the unmet needs that you think exist in Henderson County, Transylvania County, or, or even um, Western North Carolina 
um, that would help victims and survivors in you know, in the legal services in or without, I, you know, I think we're focused on legal services and we've all come into contact with this population through legal work, but what are the gaps? What are the most important ones that y'all have seen? Um, and I'll let you um, start Ellen because you're already unmuted. Um, mental health needs. Um, I, you know, the victims that are raised with this being a norm that are caught in the cycle, um, it, you know, it, it's not six sessions of counseling meeting um, with somebody just out of school or in training. They, you know, they need serious counseling over time um, to be able to help them um, get out of the cycle. And that's tough, I think, in any community. I mean, even, even you know, metropolitan areas that have more resources, um, I think that that's a huge, huge need. That, that would be the biggest one that I see outside of training and education to people who deal with, with, with survivors. And so when you're, when you're talking about that, you mean just really counseling and education, age appropriate, of course, for the children that are growing up in this environment? Children and the adults. I mean, the, the, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a family unit. If the children are getting therapy, great. But if the parent isn't also getting it, 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 it's not going to work. Um, you know, it's, it, it's a family dynamic and we need the family counseling. Um, that's controversial, but I'm going to let you, Megan, speak to that. Um, it feels like a long time since I let you speak. I apologize for that, if that's true. Um, so what would you say the gaps and the unmet needs are for our survivors? So um, I agree with um, what Ellen mentioned. Um, another thing I'd sort of add on to that is um, unfortunately in Henderson County, and I know in many other counties in the district, um, there is a lack of affordable housing. Um, and that is oftentimes a big issue for our clients because let's say they're renting with their abuser they either have to leave and find a new place that they can afford on their own, or they can stay and they may, might not be able to afford the rent on their own. Um, and so that lack of affordable housing sort of comes into play there. Now, a safe light obviously is amazing in that they provide, you know, this emergency shelter for folks um, as sort of a um, sort of a, a band aid, a great band aid, but. Um, you know, not a permanent solution. Um, so that's one issue I think um, has been tried to address um, through programs like the NC Hope program, um, which has been a sort of trying to help people with rental assistance if they've been um, negatively impacted by COVID. But just as a general issue, I think having access to affordable housing would be really important for survivors who are trying to sort of rebuild. Absolutely. Yeah. Where do you, how can you leave if there's nowhere to go and nowhere to go that you can afford? Um, Marianne, do you have anything other than um, what you had said previously? What would you say are the gaps and the unmet needs that exist in the community for survivors? Um, like I said before, education is the most important thing, but I, I agree with what Ellen said. Mental health is a huge issue, which I think is lacking. Um, I also think drug treatment is also huge and we don't have it. We, we really don't have what we need to address the problem, but I would take it one step further. Ellen said that, you know, it's a family unit problem, but if you think about how much DV touches on everybody, it's a community problem. It affects all of us. We don't realize it right away, but Judy, like what you, you said in the beginning, you had, you know, you have a friend, a child who is not related to that family who happens to be there when it's happening, right? Or you have a a DV victim who 
um, you employ and she doesn't come to work because of the abuse. It's stuff that affects us all as a community. So the most important thing I think is education. Um, we have one more um, question, but then, or one more topic. And then um, we have, if there's questions, we'll answer them. If not, I'm gonna give you guys like a opportunity to speak about whatever's most important to you that you haven't gotten to. Um, and I think Megan will probably start with you, except you just left. I don't see you. Ellen, we'll start with you then. Um, what are some of your priorities for the coming year? Um, and and how, how would you accomplish them, Ellen, in regards to this um, ongoing fight for education and to help survivors? Oh, that's a tough one for me. Um, I certainly try to support and help Safe Flight in any way that I can. Um, again, I'm happy to help with education, although I, I have found with any training that I put on that the most Im impact I see is to have the survivors speak you know, to have one survivor speak to a group of um, doubting, um, you know, people that doubt that, it, that it's real and that it happens to, to real people, um, not just uneducated, not just, you know, drug abusers, or it, I think that is um, very, very, very impactful and very important. That's not quite saying what I would do, but, um, in, in my quest for educating the community, that's what I would continue to push for and have in the past. Yeah, I would agree. I think that's really important. Um, Marianne, what would you say would be the most important thing to you in the upcoming year um, in supporting this work? Um, I am working with SAFE as close as I can. Um, I've offered to do some trainings to help them when they're helping victims go for 50 Bs so that, um, like I said earlier, it's all the information that the court needs. Um, the other thing, um, I want people to know that I'm here if PISCA can't help them and that um, I will take cases pro bono. I don't ever want somebody to be turned away and feel like there's nobody out there for them. They are not the easiest cases. They can be really difficult, but at the same time, these are, I mean, it, it, it's one of the reasons why um, I enjoy doing what I do, because I can help somebody. I'm not here to make, don't tell Doug I said this, a million dollars, kidding. <laughs> but it's not what it's about. It's about helping people. And I don't ever want the door shut on somebody who needs help. So my thing is to get my name out there, um, help safe in any way that I can and even help PISCA if they need it. So like taking cases they can. Right. It doesn't look like we have any questions. So, um, and we've covered a lot of ground talking about the education of being one of the most important. I, th I think that that's really the key. And obviously both of you um, thought that that was the most important unmet need just to, within the court systems, without the court systems. I um, I think that, um, oh, there was, there is one. All right, all right, Morgan, we're gonna address your question in just a second. Um, I was just gonna finish this thought in that um, if, if anybody hasn't heard a survivor tell their story, who's actually, um, not in crisis, but after crisis, like what Ellen said, that is probably the most powerful um, story you'll have heard. And I try to share with attorneys that are doubting um, that people need protective orders and need help all the time, that the most tragic stories, the most violent stories, um, the stories that have all of us do this work year after year, those stories don't have hearings in court. You'll never meet those survivors um, because they're terrified to walk into a courtroom. And I think that that's one of the things that the court system needs to know 
the most of. They need to hear those survivors. I'd love to see all of our judges hear the stories from the victims that got treated in the way sometimes they get overlooked um, in the court system and walked out and never came back. Um, I think that would be good. All right, so the question is from Morgan Perkins. Um, I often see hearings continued repeatedly. One of my clients may be on her ninth appearance for a domestic violence protective order to track a criminal case. Oh yeah, this is what happens. If the client or the client's attorney is prepared and ready to go forward, but it is out of their hands because of the tracking of the criminal case, I think is what Morgan's speaking to. How can we reduce this continued trauma when survivors have to keep going to hearings when it's up to the judge's discretion? That's a great question. Um, Megan, you just popped back in. So I'm gonna let Marianne, you're unmuted. Would you like to speak to that? Actually, I yeah, I would. Um, it drives me insane to, and I talked to Rebecca about this earlier, when I sit in court and I watch either criminal or civil, where the, the DV victim is asked to come to court over and over and over again. She's on her 20th time and they're like, well, we're gonna continue it again. Why? Why isn't anybody prepared? And I, I think the thing to do is to say to the, if you're tracking the criminal case, ask the, you know, ask the assigned district attorney to that case, hey, are we gonna go to trial? What's going on, right? What is the delay? Because everybody knows a criminal case does not get better with time. It gets worse. If you don't, if you can't, if you can't try this case, then what are we doing? Right. And the only thing that you're doing is, in a sense, re-victimizing the victim. You have to come to court, you have to miss work, you have to find child care, you have to do all of this stuff, right? To the point where she's like, I give up. And it's almost like a game of chicken. Let's see how long it's going to take for her to give up. Or him, we do have male DV victims. I don't mean to just say she all the time. Um, so I, I think, again, that goes to preparation. Are the attorneys prepared? And it also goes to the court. No, I'm sorry, you can't have another continuance. Enough is enough. Fish or cut bait. It's my personal opinion again, not popular. I just well, wish you had some stronger opinions, Marianne. I mean, <laughs> Ellen, would you like to address that? I know you've seen that. That's a that's something that we do regularly see in um, our counties down here. Is that you know when you go, it's going to be continued to track the criminal case. Uh, Marianne, that was very well put. I'm not even sure I can add anything to that. Um, yeah, I mean, the judges, sometimes it's, it's um, you know, their, their dockets are booked and, and the courts are overworked, but um, they need to know the importance, the judges need to know the importance of um, finality for, for survivors. Um, that's the whole, the whole concept of family court is to move it through speedily and give it some finality. Um, that, of course, the emphasis is more on the kids, but it's the same way with, with survivors. You know, they, you're right, they're re-victimized every time they go back in. Um, so I think it's partially, again, education of our, of our judges a and anybody in the system that is working with victims. Well, I'll tell you, I'm learning a lot today. I'm also learning that I'm a bad moderator because I want to answer all these questions with you guys. Um, but I, I, <laughs> you know, we, we, we have had in the past, um, a really good, uh, victims advocate who worked with the district attorney's office in Henderson County. And the last time I went to court, which this was, um, a client just this last year, uh, we went nine times, nine times for the protective order and it kept getting continued. Um, and really, I had to stand in front of the judge and say, here's the, all the dates that we were here before. And, and, and this is literally month eight. And we don't have a protective order. And we haven't had a hearing. And, and this is ridiculous, you know, which isn't a fun thing to do when you see the same judges um, every year. And it was not a judge that was particularly educated in domestic violence. But you know, the judge to the judge's credit did say, this is it. 
we're doing it today. Uh, but, you know, if, if that person doesn't have an attorney or if the attorney isn't there and doesn't have all their notes and they're not ready, like Marianne said, it would have been continued again. And then, you know, every month you go, they're going to cancel it. They're going to have to choose over a school meeting or a medical appointment or losing a job. So, all right, Megan, you answer that one if you'd like to, please. Did you hear the whole question? I didn't hear the whole question, but I can sort of surmise from your responses. Um, I agree with everything everyone said. I would say um, one thing that I have noticed in other counties that I worked in previously that sort of helps folks a little bit with some of these issues is having sort of, um, this is in Mecklenburg County, they have uh, you know, free childcare at the courthouse. So that kind of took a burden off of folks who their biggest issue was, I can't find someone to watch my kids to come to court this many times. Obviously it's not great to come to court regardless of if you have these issues so many times, but that was at least one way people were able to make it a little bit easier for folks. Um, another thing that could, you know, maybe make things easier is if they know that there is a criminal case that, um, you know, the civil case is going to need to be continued to track with, you know, having folks on video standby or phone standby where they can come in within like 30 minutes so they don't have to come to the courthouse if it, we all know it's going to be continued anyways. Um, so, you know, those are just things I would add to all the great things Ellen and Marianne said previously. Yeah, I would say that, I, you know, probably one of the thinner things to do or more fun, I'm not saying it correctly, grammatically, but um, is to know that you're going to walk in and it's going to be continued um, and have the defendant show up and have your client not even be there so that they don't even get to see her and intimidate her. <laughs> that's really, uh, that's a satisfying feeling sometimes or intimidate him, like Marianne said. Um, I is does anybody else have any other questions? I'm not seeing any questions. And I want to give each of you an opportunity to say um, anything that we haven't covered that y'all think would be important as relates to the topics we've discussed. Um, Ellen, I'm going to let you go first because you're at the top of my screen. Uh, did I unmute? Yeah. Um, I don't think I have anything to add. Um, I, you know, to the topics we've we've discussed, I don't. There's nothing I have to add unless I hear something, and I'll jump in later. Okay. And Marianne, Megan, either of you guys have something else to add? I don't. I would just add that you know having these sort of events or presentations panels are always um, so wonderful to be a part of hearing from other people in our community who are doing this work um, and having people um, from the public join in. Um, that's really one of our goals um, at PISGA in our annual plan for this year is to really engage with the community um, on these topics and engage with the private bar um, on these topics as well. So I'm happy that we were able to do this today. Actually, and that's the question you missed when you um, when you dropped out, Megan, was um, what you know what the priorities were um, for you in doing this work this upcoming year. So it sounds like more maybe community, not education, but more community input. What would how would you characterize that? Yeah, um, community outreach, community engagement with our work, um, especially um, we have. Uh, we're serving new counties, um, you know, we're, we seem to be growing every single year. So developing relationships um, in the community is really important so people know what we do and how we can help. And when people get involved with us too, we're able to um, link them with other great resources in our community, like Safe Flight, like the Mediation Center, like other nonprofits that do amazing things. Um, so that's one of our goals. Um, another, I mean, overall, our goal is to always provide holistic services to as many people as we can um, and increase our capacity to take on a variety of cases for folks who can't afford to hire private counsel. 
Awesome. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists um, for sharing your experience and your thoughts and wisdom and sharing it um, for all of the people that were attending today. Thanks, everybody, for participating with us today. This may not seem like it's a big presentation, but an hour of time of people focused on this topic. I, I do think that that's important. I think that there's can be magical outcomes for that. Um, if you will remember to fill out the survey at the end of the presentation, um, and then you can receive your certificate of attendance by next week, all the CLEs will be submitted. And then if you, if you will go ahead and get registered now for the next panel on Zoom, and that link is in your chat. If you don't know how to get to your chat, if you'll look at either the bottom or the side of your screen, there should be a chat box. And if you hit that, um, I believe Rebecca has posted a link on the side that you can just click on and it'll take you to um, a place to, you can sign up for the next panel. If you have any questions or comments, um, please don't hesitate to email the community outreach manager and that's Rebecca Alford and she's got her email in the um, chat also. And I think that's it. Thank you everyone for coming. And we've got a few more minutes. Um, if anybody has another question or if anybody had a question on what the next panel was entailing. Um, Rebecca, if you wanna tell anybody what the next panel was or Lauren. Yeah, I'll pop on for just a minute. We have another panel that's listed um, right there on the side for you to hit the link and sign up for that one. That will be part four of our serious series this year for legal advocacy. So that one's going to be November 4th on Zoom. And again, all of our panels are able to um, be watched later. They are being recorded. If you can't watch live, then you are able to access the first two are for free CEUs and the second two are for free CLEs. So we're thrilled to offer this and have it for the community for this year. I'm going to add on just because we, we have a few minutes that we're excited as Safe Flight to be growing and moving and looking constantly at gaps in our services. And today was very helpful to us to make sure that we're on the right track of what's coming next. I will share that Safe Flight purchased an additional building in August. It is located on Washington Street beside the library, and it will house next year our Child Advocacy Center, our Family Justice Center, and our Counseling Center program programs together under one roof with different entrances will move into this facility, which will really help us build in some of those gaps to include uh, looking at how we're going to bring in in the next few years a model for a family advocacy center, where we hope to be able to do adult medical exams in our community, which we haven't had before. We're additionally in a lot of cahoots and talks with law enforcement. I actually meet with Fletcher Police Department next week. We have Hendersonville Police Department on board and, of course, the Sheriff's Department working with us as well as Laurel Park as we are bringing in next year the lethality assessment program. It's a nationally accredited program called LAP and that helps our law enforcement know how to identify and directly link into services for survivors our programs. And so we're going to be ourselves going through that training next uh, winter, spring, starting about February, March, and then bringing in our law enforcement to do that training with us. And we're thrilled that you pointed out that as a gap because we saw it too. So thank you all for your time. Uh, we'll continuously have these conversations and we really appreciate you being here as part of it with us. Okay. All right.